that person right next to the propeller was in the noise. But before <laughs> I digress even further, I should uh, actually get started. So, and it says, students teach teachers. Teachers at all day so from junior high school in New Field, Iowa, were surprised early this Monday by an educational change of pace instigated by the New Field County School System. Instead of students filing in the process to hear the teachers lecture at the head of the class, teachers found themselves being herded into the classrooms where young people lectured and assigned homework to the dumbfounded grown-ups. <laughs> students infiltrated the PA system, coached today's sports, and managed all extracurricular activities. It was a surreal experience, said one teacher when asked to describe her day. So I know this sounds incredibly strange, and I'll be asking some questions about it at the end of the presentation, but students teaching teachers may not be such an isolated occurrence. Here are some videos of me talking to teachers. This is like a noise of impending doom here. <laughs> Actually, and it looks like impending doom is not so far away because my video is not loaded, but that's okay. I'll just describe what should be going on while it's buffering. Um, basically, I do video conferences with. Oh, okay, here we go. So, this is an example of what I'm going to do. Of all these periods of rapid change in recent history, you're probably used to new jobs, uh, 
uh, replacing old ones we see you know manufacturing construction uh, more of those jobs going overseas and uh, if you think about it you might ask yourself well, really who worked in forensic accounting a hundred years ago or who was a green funeral director or a menu psychologist that was my favorite i really love to be a menu psychologist uh, but with the revolution of technology over the past 50 years a lot of those uh, old jobs like say hand dipping candle maker have also uh, become very much less common technology coordinators in the 1800s pretty far and few between i'm assuming so uh, the 21st century student not only has many different types of jobs to choose from but there's probably many jobs over a lifetime. The Department of Labor estimates that today's learner will have 10 to 14 jobs by the age of 38. In the olden days, which were not too long ago, you might graduate from high school or college, get a job, and stay with it for pretty much the rest of your life. And today, a far more competitive and volatile economy means that maybe you'll get a job for two years, and then you'll move on to another thing and another thing, and it'll be just a series of jobs. So the implications of all this for students of my age and for our schools are huge. Um, but if you look at the classroom, then a lot of people say in talks about education technology that the classroom hasn't changed that much. And uh, if you do look at today's classroom versus the classroom 100 years ago, the blackboard is now a whiteboard or maybe an interactive whiteboard. Um, but things that we, we still have a lot of that same attitude that a student is going to sit in a chair and you're going to get this knowledge for 55 minutes or an hour and then you're going to take a test and that's what learning is but now we're seeing some things of project-based learning with service learning with students going out and uh, volunteering but also countless learning more than just okay read from your book and take a test so the 21st century has brought innovations in technology science transportation and how we get our information so when it comes to learning and teaching I think that it's really time for us to catch up. Uh, and I have a picture here of something you might not expect in an educational presentation. The reason I have a picture of Angelina Jolie is because I read an article on CNN which had a quote from her which I thought was kind of relevant. And she said, uh, I do think that we live in a different age and the education system hasn't caught up with our children and our way of life. But we travel and I'm the first person to say, get the schoolwork done as quickly as possible because let's go out and explore. I'd rather them go to a museum and learn to play guitar and read and pick a book they love. I feel there's got to be a new way to tailor things more directly to our children. Considering the amount of information we have today, the internet and online books, we as parents need to think about how we can shake it up and make it better. So if you're not convinced by me telling you that you need to uh, really add some new elements of learning in addition to what you already have, then hopefully maybe a little star power uh, will also do that. I've actually learned when I was in language arts last year, we were practicing making uh, propaganda appeals, I think it was. So it was like emotional appeal, a logical appeal, and then of course you would like bandwagon and <laughs> all of those. So while I learned a great deal in school, how to do quadratic equations, define the characteristics of modernist poets and law styles, I've also learned a lot from my life experiences from going to conferences like this one and going to sessions. You usually don't expect a 13-year-old student to be going to these sessions about how to differentiate instruction or something, but I've learned a lot from these conferences that otherwise I wouldn't have learned uh, sitting in a classroom. And I actually go to an online school, uh, so that's kind of an interesting element there. All the things that I do while I'm not doing schoolwork, I've also learned a lot from educational websites I visited when I was little, amazing projects I had the opportunity to do, and even my experience teaching others. Because if you're a teacher, then you know that in teaching your students, you find yourself understanding the subject better. If you have to teach somebody else about something, you want to make sure that you know it 100%. I had the opportunity to, uh, math is not my strong suit, and uh, it's not my mom's either, it's more my dad's area, but my mom saw that I was struggling, she's like, well, how about you teach me? about what you're learning. And so when I had to actually teach someone about completing the square, I looked it up in the book to make sure I got it right, and uh, it's definitely uh, helps me understand more. So when you think about this clear divide between students and teachers, I think it's a good idea to let them cross over students. But I'll talk more about that later. A wonderful example of project-based learning that I wanted to share uh, comes from Edutopia.org, and it comes from kindergarten.
They were interested in the topic, and the teacher helped them find resources, helped them find websites and information for them to develop that. And when their class praying mantis died, they even turned its funeral into a project that involved writing and reading. And the great thing about this, and I can remember doing uh, really similar fun projects, is that you don't realize, oh, I'm taking in this information. I'm learning a great deal. It really kind of creeps into your head. Oh, look, I need to turn this S around, or I'm going to be writing this. And, um, so I, I've had some great experiences with that. And the teachers in this video, you can see really seamlessly incorporated technology. They uh, were using the interactive whiteboards to show letters and websites. They were creating a website for the funeral of the Craig Mantis. Uh, and they were helping students research the airplanes. And so we know that we can create this innovative technology, an uh, innovative classroom with the help of technology. But technology itself isn't this good enough. If you have something and it's malfunctioning, then you need people to help you out. And so I've been really lucky here at this conference, so there's some wonderful people here, but another huge resource that I see being used all the time in my own home and in many others uh, is young people. So raise your hand if you've ever asked a kid for help with something technology related. So you raise hand. Uh, and so for me, my mom has asked me, you know, how do I add something on the site for the calendar, et cetera. And so young people, uh, like myself, are always really willing to help. And if we have expertise on something, then we want to share that. I think that the reason behind this is, again, not because we're just naturally better at technology, it's because we've had to adapt. We've seen all these new technologies coming in since we were born. It's a commonly accepted reality that today's youth are more skilled with certain technology tools than sometimes our parents or grandparents. And maybe it makes you a little more comfortable or scary that we're kind of uh, advancing maybe with these faster and more, but um, if you find yourself in this position, it's really okay as long as you're open-minded to catching up. So my dad is a great case in point. Uh, his name is John Spitak, and he's in this picture. And so my dad is what you would not think of as an early adopter. He's kind of the opposite. So when cell phones first came out, he said, what do I need a cell phone for? I have my work phone and my home phone, and I should be talking in the car. And when, uh, and when computers, oh, and another thing, when computers first came out, he was still like typing on a typewriter and his typing is horrible that actually people took pity on him in college and typed up his papers for him. So uh, that's just saying, early adopter, definitely not. So when Facebook came out, he was not quite on it until last October. And he is really, really into it now to the extent that my sister and I are like, Dad, stop liking everything. It's kind of weird. And uh, so my dad, was asking us lots of questions about Facebook, he was really into it. He wasn't like, oh, you know, I don't like you guys know more about Facebook, I don't like you know more about what I'm doing here. Uh, I, okay. uh, I don't like you know more about these things. He would ask us questions, but it was really nice because usually we're the ones who are asking our dad questions. What's the deal with my mind can be able to How do I solve this inequality? So to be in the position of a teacher to say, here's how you set up the blog, let's work through this together, here's how you make a new post on Facebook, that was a really empowering feeling for me. So I set up a blog for him, I got him on Twitter, showed him the addictive cell phone game app, Angry Birds, and <laughs> various other things. The, and the funny thing is, my dad being online, he's after Angry Birds, might actually equal more in-person conversation because suddenly it's, oh, well, how do you do this? And this is a really interesting feature that I think he's should take more consideration of. I just got to level 21. And uh, other than, so I encourage all of you to do the same, whether you're at home and you're asking your kids, how do I do this, or in school. Um, those of you who work with middle and high school students who are really into their cell phones, you might look at that as a really a negative thing, that we're into Facebook, that we're into social networking. But you can turn it into a positive by asking students to put all the energy that we put into posting hundreds of pictures of ourselves, put that into creating a class website together or maybe uh, updating a blog that blogs the past or something like that. So when you just repurpose some of all the energy that goes into the social networking that maybe doesn't have an educational purpose, to something having to do with education, I think uh, that creates a really powerful experience. Put my teacher hat back on me in terms of social networking. Some of you in the audience might think, oh, LOL, OMG, and are you a cookie quizzes? So Facebook definitely has applications for totally useless things. And there is a lot of shallow communication going around that is just three letters. But I've seen a lot of evidence that shows that students use Facebook, Twitter, cell phones every day for more than just uh, 
talking on their cell phones uh, or they're talking with friends. For instance, uh, take a look at the profiles or the um, status posts of some of my friends. Um, this, uh, Priya said, I think they present the Spanish skit tomorrow, so I'm going to memorize the lines. And there's this discourse going on about homework, inside jokes, about something I'm going to do in chemistry. And so people are really using these tools for uh, many different purposes. And I'm one of those kids. From a really early age, I was using the internet to dig around for learning resources. Because I started reading chapter books at three and a half, and my parents decided not to send me to kindergarten two years later to learn my alphabet. And so they homeschooled my sister and me for quite a few years using a combination of a lot of online resources at uh, the after school that my mom ran. So during the time that we weren't at season learning, the after school and the home program and school district providing classes, my sister and I would be playing outside reading or a great deal of time surfing educational websites. I really loved uh, BBC schools where I would uh, go and read about all these BBC courses we did on TV, so it would be fun to watch them. And then I would play all these really grisly history interactives like preparing a corpse for mummification. It sounds really inappropriate for a seven year old, but it's actually really fun. And <laughs> it was, you got to, well, actually, I shouldn't give the details, but it was very realistic. Not, not realistic in the sense of, oh, it's a picture, but it was an interactive and it told you a lot about the history of Egypt. That kind of stuff along the way. So all of these things that we maybe wouldn't have run into and that we maybe wouldn't have internalized so well if we were just here just reading a chapter on ancient Egypt. Um, I really learned a lot through playing games and the websites and researching stuff that I was interested in. And I have fond memories of reading uh, the works of Russian playwright Anton Chekhov when we were studying him at the Rubik's Project Gutenberg, which is a site that distributes classic books for free. I would write opinion pieces based on CNN.com articles. I look up words I didn't know on dictionary.com or their synonyms on source.com. I would type, play typing games online, I wrote stories, so I really used my computer to pretty much everything that it could do where I tried to. And with, uh, at Seats of Learning, the after school program that my mom ran, I had with some other students, our teachers started us on a becoming an expert project, which is sort of similar to what the five-year-olds were doing. We would pick a subject that we were interested in, mine was ancient China, and then we would do as much research about it as we could look stuff up online, we check out books from the library, and then we would write blog posts to share what we had learned with others. And we would get comments from our classmates and our teacher, and it was a really fun experience because it was one of the um, first times that I had seen that not only could I learn about a topic, I could also teach to others. I could share that information, and it gave me a greater sense of responsibility. As I said earlier, you know that when you want to teach something, you have to really understand it fully. So when I was going to write about the Qing Dynasty, I was going to know everything about the Qing Dynasty that there was to know if I could. And with, when I got feedback on my blog, it really helped me understand, here's an area that I need to work on describing more, I need to cite my sources. And I felt that this was all really more authentic than just writing paper and turning it in, because what would happen to that paper? It would just get lost in my binder, get recycled when I got home. When I wrote a blog post, I would get comments, even maybe a year afterwards, two years afterwards, that would remind me of what I had learned, and uh, I really internalized it. And creativity and uh, genuine inspiration to do this project is one thing, but pure fun is another. Another one of our projects that we did through blogging and writing was uh, a story having to do with the nations of Dnanok and Bulgad. So if you haven't heard of them, I'm not surprised, because to learn about propaganda and dictatorship who were uh, who advanced for like seven to nine year olds, now that I think of it. Uh, then we created a fake nation in our season learning class, and it's called the Nainok, and it was ruled by the repressive dictator King Damocles, who was played by our teacher, Lisa. And for five or ten minutes of class time, we would all assume these various roles and goals to kind of see what would life be like under this imaginary person who's not letting you write what you want or say what you want. Uh, and so we took on these different roles. And then we created our nation's history really interactively, as only really rambunctious seven and nine year olds could. We uh, would talk about what we wanted to do, create propaganda, get arrested for speaking out. And eventually, once we select the room, we had a mock rebellion and locked her out and created a transition democratic government. So if this sounds really frightening to you, then it was actually a genuine project. It was to learn about uh, different types of government, and propaganda, and so we actually covered things that we're supposed to learn about. Um, it was quite fun. Now, when you think about the way that you learned about things like propaganda or 
different forms of government. Then maybe it was uh, somebody writing on a blackboard, okay, here's making a chart, here's the type of government, here's what it means, here's a, a country that has a type of government, maybe you memorized that and took a test on it, and uh, got an A, I'm assuming, and, and went on. But because we have this game, because I have a story to tell even today, I remember it better, and I have fond memories. Later, we each created our own country, and we would write blog posts to describe them, and we created it very, uh, in a very real way. I even wrote a script for an imaginary newscast about my country, Bula Dads, and much of this wasn't even assigned to me. I just went out and I wanted to do it because I was having so much fun. As a writer, I love creating stories, but this was something where I took an imaginary country and I wrote about it in a non-fiction way. So teaching me how to write persuasively, or how to write even the script for a nightly newscast, and uh, and it was for an imaginary country. So that was a pretty amazing experience. The pro these projects taught me a lot about different forms of government, about nations, about dictatorship, propaganda, and because I have this story, then I think I remember it better. Uh, yes. So for those of you who say that seven-year-olds should be blogging, I'd like to point uh, out that yeah. privacy is Sorry, a concern. You can always make it private to your class or to your yeah. You want and to that there are lots of amazing projects yeah. that you can do with you want parents or classmates commenting and reading. Okay. And, uh, then you, lots of you can come and what um, you can finally about. call me. So growing up, some of my most powerful technologies um, you that can I can come. use were word processing and blogging and surfing educational websites. Okay, great. When I wrote See. for an audience, it helped me realize that my role was no longer just to reading and memorize and the <laughs> test. It was a learner and a teacher. And I realized that I had the responsibility of teaching others or writing something that was entertaining. Today, tools like Facebook and Twitter allow me to go beyond uh, gaining knowledge and sharing it to creating events and promoting causes. Oftentimes, we hear about all the predators on Facebook and uh, how many hours students spend a day just wasting their time. But a lot of people overlook the fact that many students use Facebook as a valuable homework tool and uh, to create events. So when you're finishing homework, you might think, well, okay, Facebook can do that, but surely you can do other things. And raising the bar for tomorrow's leaders, I feel, truly means starting relevant service learning today. Who said that just because we aren't grown up yet, we can't make a difference? There's so many opportunities for students to go out and learn about our world and make change that show us here's where your learning goes. This is why you're doing why you're learning about this or that, because here you can volunteer here and you can make a difference in this knowledge. In September, I ran a conference called TEDx Redmond, and it's an independently organized TED event. TED is a prestigious conference in California. And it was, the speakers were all youth, 16 or under, our organizing committee, likewise, and our attendees, we uh, sent the adults to the sign classroom, room, and the main audience was kids. So if you imagine a conference room just like this, and all kids in the audience, and all kids speaking, it was a really powerful experience. And we heard from Zoe Sprankle, the video is super quiet, so I'm not going to play, uh, but what she said was that she had spent most of her life learning, and what she said was a very boring little classroom, because she saw that what she was learning, it didn't have an impact on the world outside of the world, in the classroom, while she was in there, and she really wanted to have an impact, have an effect, and a purpose in what she was learning. And I'm organizing TEDx Redmond again this year to hear more about how we can do this. About how we can give students the opportunity to make a difference, not only inside their school, but also out. And I've had difficulty finding sponsors for TEDx Redmond, actually, because a lot of people say, well, you know, youth, they're not exactly our target audience, or we don't have a lot of spending money unless we tag on our parents' purse strings. And it doesn't seem like we hold much sway in government either, so it's hard appealing to various companies or government organizations. But people overlook the fact that youth have a huge collective voice, whether that means shopping at one particular store or not, a fan base for a superstar. Yes, Justin Bieber is, uh, if, we, if youth didn't have a collective voice, then there would be a lot of stars <laughs> who wouldn't exist. Uh, massive turnouts at protests. Yet at school, we're told to keep quiet, both figuratively as well as literally. One of the most common complaints from students is that school is boring. And I think this has less to do with the idea that textbooks are fun or that uh, learning is fun, but more to do with the fact that what we do, what we learn, we don't see its uh, effects very often. So Ted India speaker, Kiran Mirsaki, decided to change that with some experimentation. So, yeah. 
every uh, year the city, or sorry, every month the city would wall off a certain street, which happened to be like the busiest one, and turn it into a giant playground for children and their imagination. And while I know that rolling incense sticks for eight hours is probably illegal, uh, especially if you make your students do it, um, I do think there are ways that are perfectly fine by all and, and do apply to state standards that will get your students empowered and learning about how they can make change and apply the learning that they've uh, gone through reading textbooks and being in the classroom and uh, have an impact on the world. So I was reading an editorial article art about social media and education that mentioned this example. In true problem-based learning format, science teacher Ryan Heavitt asked a group of eighth graders at his school to pick a problem and solve it. So I have to do a science, and they picked buffalo grass, which is a flame-resistant grass that just spreads really quickly, crowds out the native uh, plants, and devours the natural habitat. So once the students had discovered the plague-like bee, I quote her, they weren't sure how to spread the word of its forest. One student declared that they needed to get the word out which is when they decided to create a Facebook page devoted to the threat and posted a rap song on YouTube to inform people about this dangerous thing. And it shows that uh, sometimes things can have environmental effects beyond what we might have foreseen. But it doesn't teach us in a traditional way, with teachers standing at the head of the classroom in front of the whiteboard saying, okay, we're going to take a look at this example to help the grass and this is why it was introduced, this is what it does, and this is why it's a bad thing. Um, by taking ownership over their learning, they went out and they did the research, they created the rap, they were motivated to start the Facebook page. They really became interested in an issue and had an impact outside of their classroom. And this reminds me a lot of the projects that I did with the imaginary countries. I became super interested in it. I would write blog posts, I would write stories, and that's the same kind of thing that can be applied to real life problems. I hope that you all ask yourself, what are some problems that affect my community? Maybe it's something like buffalo grass. Maybe it's uh, that there needs to be a new library, or it could be uh, something totally different. And how can my students be part of the solution? Many people focus on students graduating from high school and going to college as the beginning of the solution. But I believe that students can begin making a difference, solving problems within their communities far earlier. In other words, make a difference classroom where students have the opportunity to solve real life problems and engage in service learning is an innovative classroom. I believe that an innovative classroom isn't just one where the world comes to us. We read about ancient China in textbooks, we um, read about ancient Egypt. It's one where we go out, we research, we write blog posts, we volunteer, we raise awareness about issues, our weekend in the world. It's where we have voice and education decisions that will affect our future. And it's a connected one, where students can connect in more ways than one, maybe not just in, per, uh, in person, but also online. It's one where we use online technology, like blogging, to create <coughs> So for about a minute here, I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you, and you're surrounded by two people to talk about them, and ask yourself, what are some projects or service learning ideas that uh, I could implement in my classroom? So think of a problem in your community, or something that your students are really interested in, or uh, maybe, maybe a technology that you've already implemented that you're going to use to turn your neighbor and, uh, and share ideas about different creative projects you might have that would allow students to have an impact on their world. website um, of our town, an interactive one where you can, this is the history of all these places, yeah. with interviews and, yeah. Repeat, I'll yeah, give it Okay, so a historical website about your town. This is a great one. I had the opportunity, um, I don't know how many of you know about the National History Day project, and well, I had the opportunity to participate in that last year. I did not make it to Vital, sadly. My project is a documentary, which I will never do again in my life. And, and a website, I think a website is definitely a great idea because it allows you to pull together those elements of video and text and pictures so you can go out and interview uh, survivors or, I mean, I would say survivors, just uh, elders, I guess, in the town and ask them about their experiences. You can interview uh, new residents or who have been there and ask, uh, well, how has it changed or what have you noticed? You could write text, you could do research, you could do a little 
library and Paul Oaks about it and find primary resources. There's just so much that you could do about the history of your town. And then what you might do is you would share it with other residents in the town and say, here's our unveiling of our website, please look at it, please comment and tell us, can you add information? And you might even have a Go away, go away. Go away. Don't stand there. I'll, I'll stay over here then. <laughs> so, historical website about your town, right? Because so many people don't know that much about the city where they live. They don't know where the name comes from, or how long it's been there, uh, or how many people are in it. And that's stuff that's actually really relevant to know, because when we come to a new city, we always ask the taxi driver, oh, so how many people live here? Who's the mayor right now? And it's nice when the taxi drivers are able to tell us all this information. And so to have a website, have a resource to share that is a great idea. Any other ideas for projects? Then the internet has done the same thing. 
But too many students and teachers are stuck as those monks copying out books by hand when we have so many resources available. Why do we have to restrict learning about math to an hour of class time per subject or history or writing? By using the internet, by giving students long-term projects that allow them to combine things like blogging or creating a website or a documentary, then you also give us a sense of purpose and you allow learning to surround us, not just in class, but also when we're thinking about our project, when we have ideas for it. Uh, maybe even when we wake up in the morning, we might be thinking about it. That's how it was when I did these projects, like becoming an expert and old dads and they not are really, really into it. And you probably want to see your students <coughs> having that passion for a topic that you're teaching. But I've done a lot of talking about innovation and technology and project-based learning. These are relatively new things, but one of the things which makes teaching uh, effective, even beyond all those other things, is something that has been around pretty much as long as a profession. So think back to your best teachers. And this could be elementary, middle, high school, college, mentors outside of school. And like, what made them so effective? Why did I love this teacher so much? Uh, what about, what was it about them? Raise your hands if you feel that the teacher that you're thinking of made a real personal connection with you, that they knew you or cared about your learning. So I think probably everyone will raise hands, unless you don't have a favorite teacher, you're very unlucky, then I <laughs> would say that most of your favorite teachers are your favorites because you felt like care. Uh, one of my favorite teachers, Mrs. Vindovich, was my eighth grade teacher. And she would check in on me and was always following, you know, where, uh, where I was speaking and watching my speaking videos. And she even bought three copies of my book, Dancing Fingers, which was very kind of her and sent me one of her favorite books. So it was always keeping in touch, was always in contact, giving me valuable feedback, and was very understanding. And so I felt that that was really um, the most thing you could ask for in a teacher, that they really genuinely cared about you. And it's that personal connection that you have to strive for in your teaching. Even though I've, I've only met Mrs. Vinovich in person a few times, probably four or five, because I go to an online school, the personal connection that was made over email, over the phone, uh, and in person, that was extremely valuable. So with new technology, when it seems like everyone is living behind a computer, those personal connections can be made, not just face-to-face, -face, but also through video conferencing, through blogging, through email, uh, on the phone, all of these things. If you think back to your best teachers, they probably weren't the ones who read line by line out of the textbook and just were pretty much robots. They were the ones who took that personal interest in their learning. Personal relationships with students affect how well your students learn even before they come into your classroom. I watched a great speech at TEDx from here by Patricia Poole, professor of speech and <coughs> sciences at the University of Washington. And apparently, uh, she said, babies at birth are citizens of the world. That means they respond to syllables from all kinds of different languages, not just the one they're born into. <laughs> that for constant exposure to one language, they become very nationalized. They lose that ability to recognize syllables. When that was counteracted, when American babies were exposed to Mandarin from a university research assistant, much like having a Chinese relative in the house, as she put it, the babies kept recognition of that language's unique sounds. But when they watch the Chinese on TV or listen to an audio program, no effect. It goes to show the importance of personal connections. And I think this also plays into with when we memorize things, when we, me when we memorize it for a purpose, or when we memorize it as part of a project, we not only remember the information, but we remember the story around it. The continual importance of making personal connections has been reinforced over and over again. Thomas Friedman, uh, author of The World is Flat, was giving a commencement speech recently, and he said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, that if you ultimately want to make change, you have to get off Facebook and in someone's face. And while I think that Facebook is a great tool for change, we've seen a lot of things become possible because of it. The movements which have spread on Facebook and Twitter wouldn't have ultimately been possible without the humans behind them, without the let's go start a revolution, or let's create this event, or let's spread the word about tree planting. Although the newspaper clipping I showed you at the beginning of the session was actually uh, created online using a fake newspaper clipping service, it's really handy when you want to trick people. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if, were any of you, did any of you think, what was your impression? Did you think it was real? I see some nodding, some nodding. Maybe some of you kind of doubted it. Perhaps, but, um, so this is, I actually made it up to kind of trick people into thinking. This is happening. But you can really learn a lot about it. Not necessarily by only reversing the roles, by having the students on the PA system and coaching the sports and giving it a little homework. But I would like you to consider 
uh, what you can learn from your students. Raise your hand if you've ever learned about something more than just a piece of technology from a student. I see a lot of raised hands. And for me, even though I do teaching over you promising, and a lot of times when I connect with students, it might be my first and last time that I'll see them, I'm able to learn from them just by what they tell me. A lot of times in my view conferences, I'll do collaborative writing. So we make writing more approachable. I don't just give them an assignment and say, here, go ahead and write it. We start out by working together. Let's write a story. And uh, our last story that we actually was supposed to be a poem, I think it was a weird poem, but it was, I wrote, I was thinking it was with fourth graders. And the story, or sorry, the poem, the narrative poem, was about a ninja who had to fight a dragon and got so scared that he wet his pants. So, kind of interesting topic for a poem. But what I learned from that experience is that there's no right or wrong. I wasn't going to say, hey, this isn't a poem because it's not about daffodils. <laughs> this taught me that there was, that really, when it comes to writing, I'm not going to say, hey, we're not going to write about this, and I don't like this topic. I'm not going to read this out because it's way too embarrassing. No. And that really taught me something because a lot of times I kind of restrict my imagination. No, I'm not going to write about that. That's kind of weird. That. So, that really helped me learn from those students who I just uh, talked to once. And when you think about it, the best relationships are reciprocal. What was the last good friendship you had with someone who never wanted to know what, what you thought? And while well, teaching isn't uh, necessarily a friendship, but it is definitely a relationship. And it should be where you're open to learning from your students. It's easier to listen to someone when they listen to you. When I feel respected, I'm more likely to return the feeling. <coughs> What is it exactly that you can learn from your students? Well, for a quick minute here, please turn to the person next to you and say, here's something I learned from my students. They would hear you. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So, anybody have something to share that you learned from your students? Yes. Uh, John Cena, WWE wrestler. Didn't know anything about him. I did a project on Ask an Expert. Each kid taught me about whatever they knew the most about. Them. So that was it. I learned way more than I knew. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great thing, though. Because, um, actually, this is the thing, though, is that when I found that because I have my smartphone, my smartphone doesn't actually work as a phone. I got it for free at the TED conference. And, uh, yeah, I know they give out phones for free. That's kind of amazing. And uh, so I, what I use it for is the internet. And that means that if I have a burning question at 3 a.m., then I can just look it up on the internet, and so I'll find answers to the, quite all the weirdest questions, and um, it's kind of amazing that I'm just able to look it up like that and find my answer. And what's happened is that this is kind of similar thing that's happened. I'll find a lot uh, more about things that I wouldn't have learned if I were just, you know, uh, reading the science books or something. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of an amazing ability. Any other things you've learned from students? A group of blue jays is called a party? Yes. Okay, I don't know. I'm not sure the names of like fertile animals, so I, that's good to know. <laughs> okay. Anyone else learn from their students? Whether it's a vocabulary word or a philosophy of life, it could be pretty much a Okay, well then we'll advance the presentation. I think that there's really a lot to be learned. We, whether you're asking some simple questions, or you have to ask, ask an expert, or they bring a topic of their expertise, you can learn a lot. Uh, maybe as far as the philosophy of life stuff, it could be the naive belief that anything is possible. And for those of you who have gone through life, you think, well, no, it's not. But many five-year-olds think that. The reason that I got started with speaking and going to schools and talking to students about reading and writing was because at five, I didn't realize that there were people who didn't like to read and write. And upon hearing that, I decided I'm going to change that. There was no less statistics to determine the feasibility of the execution of this project. It was, I'm going to go to the local elementary school and let's have a presentation where we all write about stuff they almost together. And that was it. Maybe it's the creativity that you see in three-year-old's crayon drawings. Or the idea that, or, or maybe our expertise in technology, as I talked about earlier. So it's obvious that just as we can learn a lot from you, you can learn a lot from us. And yet too often our schools don't create that many opportunities for young people to share what they know. So those of you who have I, uh, projects where students can share what they're passionate about and what they know about, as well as what they're actually about in research chat, uh, that, that's extremely valuable to students. 
at the kids' conference I organized, TEDx Sunday, we heard from speakers who talked about uh, budget cuts in their schools and cafeteria lunches, and, uh, impact and creativity, all these education-related things which affected them. And in every case, these were things which had been uh, decisions which had been made without any input. A lot of schools don't have a framework in place for asking students, well, what do you think about this? What would be the impact of this decision on your everyday life since you're the one going to school every day? And I think that this is something that you can all work on, whether it's starting in your classroom, uh, giving student input on the next project or on a unit of study. Uh, I think that we can all do our part to make sure that students feel that they have a voice not just outside of school, but in. At my house, we have a book of brain teasers, and one of them tells a story about a boy going to the hospital, and he's seen by a doctor who says, this is my son. But his dad isn't in the hospital, so how is this possible? Well, for those of you who've heard this brain teaser before, of course, it's his mom, who's the doctor, and a lot of people think of doctors as being men, and so it's a stereotype. What is the image that you think of when you hear a teacher? Probably it's a group looking much like you. But why does the teacher always have to be an adult? I want you to think about that image, and maybe the next time you think of a teacher, you'll not only see this group, but also the group that walks into your classroom every day. I've been making comparisons about student hats versus teacher hats, and I'm going to think in the perspective of a teacher now, but really you shouldn't have such a clear divide, because everyone has something to learn, and everyone has something to teach, because we heard you've learned from your students about technology and about other things, and raising the bar for tomorrow's leaders means letting us have experience leading and teaching today. Teaching and learning is a two-way street, but unlike on the real street, there's no driver's age requirement. To the educators in the audience, I'd like to thank you for your hard work in raising the bar for tomorrow's leaders. I encourage each one of you, whether you're a teacher or a student or both, to think about what you each can learn from the other. Because after all, I think it's very true that only when we know how to learn, we really know how to teach. Thank you.